Hello again everyone, I hope you're all keeping well. In this video I would like to speak with you about the fear of mortality. Now this sounds like a very morbid subject, uh, but I don't want that to dissuade you, okay? I don't want that to put you off in terms of thinking about this. And it's very important that we think about this because insofar as I have looked at things, all the events that are happening today, the events that have happened through history, they boil down to one thing, and that is the fear of dying, the fear of your own mortality. This, I suspect, is at the heart of all the pain, all the suffering that we cause ourselves, and all the pain and suffering that we cause other beings as well. Because we have not understood that this life of ours is impermanent. We have developed this idea because of uh, rationalist materialism run amok, okay? Because of the reductionist material worldview, we have developed this idea, for reasons which I can get into a little bit later, we've developed this idea that everything around us is permanent in some way, shape or form. And this is a very new way of looking at things, by the way, because before, before the rationalists came on the scene, human beings weren't like that. In any culture, in any civilization, they were not like this. In the European traditions, you had the Druids, who were great at understanding nature. And nature is not something external of you. This is a very, very, very important point. We make the mistake today. If somebody talks about nature, you think, oh, well, it must be something out there. Okay? Uh, it must be the forests and the trees and the woods and the jungles. That's nature. No. You have misunderstood entirely what nature is. Nature is operating around you right now. I'll give you a small example of this. This is going to be a very long video probably, but I'll give you a small example. When you are breathing... Okay. When you take a breath, you're breathing the oxygen in, the air is going into your lungs, and then it's being transported to all the different uh, necessary organs in your body. But where does that oxygen come from? Okay, it's in the atmosphere. But why is the atmosphere hospitable to life? Okay, why is the atmosphere hospitable to your existence? And the answer is because the trees and the algae and the plants and everything else is producing oxygen. Okay, but it's not producing oxygen in the sense that we're taught sometimes in schools. Because that's also a, a fallacy. This is one of the reasons why I hate the schooling system so much. But I won't go into that in this video. I've already done one on this. So... The trees and the algae and all these other life forms are breathing in the carbon dioxide that you breathe out. Okay, this is just a very simple example of it. And simultaneously, you're breathing in the oxygen that they are, if you want to call it, exhaling. Okay? There's a symbiosis between you and nature happening all the time. Inside your body, nature is operating. Okay, nature is in operation. There's a process happening. You understand this? There's a process happening. So this is why when people talk about nature being external of themselves, I get very annoyed. Because this is nonsense. Okay, but the Druids understood nature all forms of nature, even external forms if you want to think of it that way. Uh, although that's actually the wrong way to think. But anyway, let's let's go with this. Because this this I can only speak to you in terms of the way in which um, the majority of people have been educated. Okay? So, um, when you interact with all that is out there, you will learn some things about it. Now, people like the Druids, people like the uh, ancient 
Vedic scholars in India and the uh, thinkers in China and the mystics in the Eastern Asian parts and many, many different places, the shamans and so on. These types of people would look at nature and understood how it worked. They understood that we are in symbiosis with all that was happening. Nature is always ongoing. And what else they discovered is that things change. Nothing is permanent. They understood this as well. Okay? They understood that, that uh, you're born, you grow, and one day you die. So they understood mortality. Now, along come the rationalists, and they say, well, things simply are what they are. You've probably heard this lots of times. Okay, sometimes maybe even I've said it, you know, just as a passing phrase or, or, or whatever. It is what it is, right? But just because it is what it is now doesn't mean that it's going to be the same thing tomorrow. You understand? It doesn't mean it's going to be the same thing tomorrow. It is impermanent. But with this notion of permanence, we incorporated this into ourselves as well. We began to think that we are permanent. Right? And to give you one tiny example of this, in daily life, you never think about yourself being a different person than who you were yesterday or five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago or if you're older, then more years. Okay? You've never thought about being a, a different person or how different you've become. You think you are the same person waking up every day. You're not the same person. Not biologically, physically, not mentally, and certainly not spiritually either. Okay? You are a completely different being. Does that mean that the essence of who you are has changed? Maybe, maybe not. It's much more complex than this even, if you want to get into the spiritual dimensions of it, because... If you want to think about it in this fashion, it's like a string on, on, on a guitar, okay? This is what the essence of a human being is. If you want to call it the spirit, you can call it this. If you want to call it the soul, you can call it that. The, by the way, the spirit and soul are two distinct things as well. But I'm not going to go into that here, okay? But when you um, pluck this string on a guitar, it makes one sound. Okay, when you uh, press it down, right, it will make a different sound. Is it still the same string that is making both sounds? Yes. Okay, it is still the same string, but it's producing two different sounds. Okay, this is very similar to what a human being is. Okay, the essence within. And my point is this. That the string itself, when you're doing all these things to it, it's changing. Okay, but the root of it, if you want to call it that, is still the same. Okay, that's, that's how it is. The, the original essence is the same. It has not changed. But the effects that are demonstrated do change. Okay? So your physical being is always changing and the thoughts which you have will always change over time. Okay? So nothing is permanent. Sounds like a straightforward, simple thing. But again, it's not. It should be, but it's not, because you've been taught all the wrong things through your life. Okay? Your parents have to told you things which are untrue. Your teachers have told you things about yourself which are untrue. 
Society has told you things about yourself which are untrue. And you've incorporated all of this into your mind. And it's doing extreme damage to you. Why? Well, this brings me back to how we cause ourselves all the pain and suffering and how we cause the pain and suffering to others that is unnecessary. Because we we get afraid when we are faced then. See, our, if we buy into the reductionist point of view, okay, and we believe things to be permanent because we are creatures of habit on one level, physically, okay, we, we buy into these notions uh, of permanence and we become creatures of habit. We assume that the way things are now, if I've organized something one particular way, it will be that way tomorrow. And it's very, very hard for us to cope with changes, say, in our physical environment or physical changes in our bodies um, or any number of things when our paradigms shift. All these things, politically even as well, they're very hard to cope with. Why? Because we assumed things were going to stay the same in some way, shape or form. If not exactly the same, then some kind of similar thing. Okay, what we don't expect is to wake up one day and find things are completely different. But how many times does this happen in life? How many times does it happen? Always almost, right? Um, say you are 100%, this is another example, say you're 100% healthy today, but you stub your toe on um, a table or something or, you know, a door, whatever, now you're in physical pain. That's something that's changed. You wake up the next morning, maybe you can't walk so well. Okay? And you get annoyed. Why are you annoyed? You're annoyed because you have just... Um, is it because you've just stubbed your toe? No, you're annoyed because now something has changed. Which means everything else around you is going to have to change as well. In some way, shape or form. Small or big. You see? And let me, let me say something else as well. Why does the, uh, let me ask a question here that, that some of you might have asked earlier, maybe even whilst I was speaking about this. Why would I say that rationalism has led to this or the, at the very least, the rationalist, materialistic, reductionist worldview. Why would that cause us to have this very damaged outlook and psyche? The answer is very simple. Because the rationalists liked to break things apart. Okay, And when they did that, they would look for the very smallest component part of whatever it was they were studying. And they would make observations about it. And they would state that those observations were definite. Okay? That is to say they were not infinite. They were definite. And they defined them. Okay? And that gave them a sense of permanence about the macro world. This was a massive mistake as we now understand. Right? Why? Because even in physics now we're learning that certain rules that apply in the macro world don't necessarily work at the subatomic level. Okay? So, the nonsense that has emerged from the mistakes of rationalism and materialism still prevails. And this is a very new way of thinking, as I said. Okay? It's only been there for a few hundred years. And it emerged during the Enlightenment. Some very good things emerged. Some not so great things emerged. One of the downsides to what emerged is that we did develop in the West, certainly. But this uh, proliferated into the East as well, as I say. The Vedic philosophers uh, originally uh, were deep thinkers about many 
facets of life itself. And that word is very powerful because we're not talking about life just in the in a contained sense. Life is always happening inside you, outside you, around you, in the atmosphere. It's always happening. Um, but let's put that aside for a second. So the Vedic philosophers, the shamans, the the these these types of people, the druids, and so on that are, that are talked about. These people all had very deep understandings. But along comes the reductionist material uh, point of view and people are attracted to it, right? But why are they attracted to it? Because it chimes very nicely with the uh, internal fear because it existed then as well of dying. OK, and, and a lot of people will get confused by this because they think, well, wait a minute, how could how could that type of point of view take away the fear of dying or, or placate it in some way? That's a good question. The answer is it doesn't truly address it. What it does do, however, is give you a half assed answer. Which sets your, which is supposed to set your mind at ease. Okay, one day you will die. That it is. That that is it. You will end. There you go. You will turn into compost, <laughs> or um, ashes. Okay, or whichever way you choose to, you know, uh, have your remains go. And that, for some people, is good because it's comforting. It means they never have to think any deeper than that. Do you understand? This is why it's comforting. But does it actually address the existential questions about yourself? No. Okay. It just gives you uh, a sense. It's like a placebo effect. It placates you. Okay. But why do we have this fear of death in the first place? Well, we have this because um, it's actually a direct consequence of living in a physical body. You see, your physical body is made up of all the elements which exist in this world, on this earth. Okay, your physical body is made up of all of that. And it is prone to decay. Like I said, it's impermanent. Now, if you understand this from the beginning, you will have very few problems in life that you cannot handle. You will be able to handle everything almost with relative ease. But when you're not taught this from a young age, okay, if not in childhood, then at the very least during adolescence or early adulthood, you need to learn that everything that you are is not going to be the same tomorrow or even a second from now or a millisecond from now and so on. But the fear, because we're not taught this, the fear that develops is, well, you know, there's always going to be some kind of existential threat to your being. Now, again, as I said, it's not brand new, this, right? It probably started off way back in our evolution at some point. Because as we emerged as human beings, there were real existential threats around from predators and so on. And if something eats you, <laughs> okay, or it attacks you, then that's going to do you some physical damage, isn't it? Right? It might even end your mortal life, okay? You'll shuffle off this mortal coil. I don't wish that to happen to you, by the way. I, I, I wish you a very long, prosperous and happy life. Uh... But the point is that this still uh, emerged, right? This, this fear from many, many millennia ago. And so the fear of death is not a new thing. But because of it, what happens? 
because you're you're scared, you're afraid, and you haven't dealt with that fear properly. The old philosophies, the mystic traditions, dealt with this. Okay, they they properly dealt with it. Like I explained, that, that, that's just a tiny part of it, but there were deeper, uh, deeper thoughts, let's call them, deeper ideas that helped a person to come to terms with death. But we abandoned that, okay? Because remember, remember what happened, I explained this uh, in, in many of my previous videos, but... Uh, the death of God in the West didn't just lead to the Christian God dying, okay, as, as Nietzsche put it. But it led to everything, as Heidegger pointed out, everything that was of a deep spiritual nature was destroyed as a direct consequence. And this spread right across the world. And it caused extreme existential crises in numerous countries. Of course, we also had the added problem of empire. Okay? Because when empire spread, whether it was British Empire or the Dutch Empire or, you know, whichever empire, um, the Islamic Empire, all these empires brought with them reductionist materialism right across the world wherever they went conquering and I'm sure it had some kind of evolutionary advantage at that time but it, 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 it isn't a proper way of uh, surviving in the long run the point being that they poisoned the chalice with this nonsense okay they poisoned the chalice and so what happens is that now you're no longer able to wrestle with the very real fundamental problems of life and death. And, and here's an example of, of how that's the case. You think of death as being separate from your life. Meditate on that for a second. You think of death as being separate to living. How insane is that? Whereas if you were... Uh, someone who had studied the ancient ideas and philosophies, you would go, wait a minute, that's not correct because death is a part of life and life is also a part of death because from death new things take root. Okay? It's cyclical. All things are cycles. But again, this knowledge has not been allowed to proliferate really because there are some sick-minded individuals who enjoy watching human beings in a state of extreme suffering. But I won't go into that here. So the point is that this fear of death, if it's not um, dealt with properly, what happens? Well, the fear still remains, okay? And because you're always feeling that your existence is under threat, you resort to direct animalistic behavior, lower level behavior, not higher forms of thinking, but lower forms of thinking. So you begin to give in to accumulation, greed. Okay, because what are the ways in which you can die? Think about this a second. What are the ways in which you can die? You can die from starvation, you can die from decapitation. You can die. See, if I list them all, these are the true subconscious fears you have. Think about it one night or one day. Okay? If you have the time, think about this. All these existential threats, you've, you think about them all the time. Because you've never been taught how to properly address them. Okay? So... Your, your subconscious mind or the, and also the, uh, what they call the reptilian mind, okay, the, the, the R complex in the brain, is always sensing potential threats to its own existence. And is saying, well, I need to accumulate in case I starve. That's one thing, just one thing that, is, that comes off as a branch from um, this fear of mortality. 
Another thing is um, physical violence. Why do people commit physical violence? If I told you that the reason that people get angry and violent is because they, they are perceiving, whether real or unreal, they are perceiving an existential threat to their being physically, people will get shocked by that. Okay, the, the, the threat can be real or imagined, but it's still, for that person, it's there. The, the greatest serial killers and mass murderers and psychopaths have had these fears. They're always afraid of dying. Okay, or of, so, you know, of somebody inflicting some harm on them. It's no accident, by the way, this is the reason, it's no accident that when you study the case histories of people who have become psychopathic killers, serial killers, you find almost 100% of the time they have been through forms of abuse of some kind in early childhood. So their system develops this constant fear, this existential threat to itself. And it's an imagined threat, but it's there all the time. And then they act out other things as a result and see one thing leads to another thing leads to another thing. So in their minds, they begin to build this complex set of structures. And those structures um, dictate how they will behave. Structures that justify their own behaviors to them. And pleasure centers that you know that the the reward centers of the brain that develops so that they feel a reward uh, physiologically or neurologically when they do whatever it is that they do but these are very complicated things okay they're not beyond your understanding you could you could go and learn about this but it fundamentally still at the root stems from a fear of um uh, a fear of death uh, a fear of physical harm Okay, all of the all of these are really basically kind of the same thing. You're feeling an existential threat to your being. So as I say, there's many ways in which fear of mortality leads us down very dark paths. And instead of accepting that we are impermanent, instead of coming to terms with what our being is. Okay, because we've been told by the reductionist materialists that this life is all there is. Well, this puts like even an even greater emphasis on trying to preserve your life then. Do you see? We have a natural inclination, biologically, to preserve our lives. And it's not just us. All life forms have this. You will never encounter a life form that doesn't try to keep going. Okay, you will never encounter a life form that wants to shorten its life uh, purposefully, except in certain conditions. There are certain types of creatures in the insect world, in the plant world, uh, even uh, some higher forms of life. You'll find that there, is, there are suicidal tendencies, for example, that can develop in certain animals. Sometimes it's a sacrificial tendency in certain types of um, arachnids or insects or animals and some plants, okay? But those are, you know, uh, rare. And that also happens, weirdly enough, in human beings specifically. I don't know quite, quite so much about these animal life forms, uh, these other types of life forms, but in human beings that also develops because of, bizarrely, a fear of mortality. And you could say, what do you mean by that? Because these people are, are ready to die. They kill themselves. They must be very much at peace with the idea of dying. The answer is no, they are not. Okay? Because they look at, because again, it's the same reductionist materialist nonsense that they've been told, right? So they're told, okay, you die, that your suffering ends, that's it. What if I told you that was a lie? 
Okay. You know, I've had people write to me many times. Um, actually, I won't share this. It's too much in confidence, I believe. But th there have been people, you know, in this world that are so deeply in agony because of their existence who want to end their lives. Okay, there are people uh, who suffer so much, whether because of physical pain or emotional pain or um, uh, some sort of crisis uh, within themselves, Th they, they genuinely want to call it quits in this life. And they think that uh, if they kill themselves, that's it, it's game over. They don't have to suffer anymore because this is the nonsense that's been pumped into their soft minds. Okay? It's not true. And here's the reason it's not true. Because the human being, that which you are, is considerably more than what you've been told. Okay, the essence of who you are is not purely physical. It is not purely material. It um, expresses itself physically. It expresses itself in multiple ways and forms, but it is not the sum total of that which you are. I'll give you an example, uh, an analogy of how I would describe if you want to call it the human soul, we can use that word. If you want to call it the human spirit, you could use this word. You could use any word you like. Unfortunately, these words don't mean what they originally meant anymore. They've been redefined. Uh, and also, people use soul and spirit interchangeably. They're not interchangeable. They're two distinct and different things. Although they are part of the whole uh, uh, the whole collection of that which you are you know that which which makes you a person um, they, they're a part of that but it's, it's too deep to get into here but the essence of who you are is much more So, there are people who would um, object to my saying this, and that's because they've never been taught to, to, to think properly, to, to think clearly, to understand. They've never been taught that we are in constant symbiosis with nature. They've never been taught that the processes and the forces that exist in this universe uh, are in harmony. They're synchronized. They've never been taught this. They've also never been taught that those forces are unseen. Okay? There's lots of things, actually, now that I think about it, that people have never properly been told. Anyway, I don't have time to go into everything that you haven't been told, but I'll, I'll use this analogy as I say. If you take a guitar string, okay, and you pluck it, it will give a certain sound, right? If you um, press down on that guitar string on a certain fret, it will make a different sound, okay? And a different one still if you do that with another fret and so on, okay? those That's for the guitarists, I guess. Violins are the same. Any string instrument, you pick one. So, the musical note which is played is different each time but the string is the same okay the string is the same this is the primary reason why you're not the same person today who you were yesterday or five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago or so on don't want to bore you but the essence of who you are is still the same. You know this at some level. The essence is still the same. Okay, the spirit of who you are is still the same. 
Your soul, by the way, develops. That is, it's not impermanent in, in that regard, but it, it's, it's, um, it's always evolving. This is why the soul and the spirit aren't the same thing. Okay, the soul is always evolving. Along with kind of your physical being. Okay, but these are these are deep concepts rooted in ancient philosophies, whether it's Vedic philosophies or uh, ancient Chinese philosophies. You know, there are multiple paths you can use to grasp better um, the sum total of who you are. Okay, but. The basic point is that analogy I gave is similar to how a human being is. The, the uh, material expression, the physical expression of the essence okay, is what you see when you are interacting in the world at large. It's not the complete you. Okay, if you were to look, if you're watching this video, right, if, if you see me in, in, in this video, or you're hearing my voice, okay, and you assume that that's the sum total of who I am, that would be a mistake. That's just a part of who I am. Okay, it's a part of who I am. It's not the totality of it. What is my point with all of this? My point is this. So when you die, are you are are you completely? I, I don't know how we describe it really. Pulverized, I guess. Right? Is everything that you are finished? This is an age-old question. People have been asking a long, long time. Okay. The materialist would say yes. Everything that you are is finished. The uh, electrical signals in the brain have stopped. The heart has stopped. Everything has stopped. Th that, that is it. And they're correct in the sense that physically there's nothing more there. Okay? Your business with this world has ended. <laughs> okay? It is finished. Uh, but... That doesn't mean that all that you were is um, lost forever, okay? Or that the essence of who you were, that's the proper way of, of putting it, I guess. The essence of who you are is gone. It hasn't gone anywhere, okay? It, it was never here in the first place. Okay, I'm sorry I'm laughing. It's just because when I think about these things, I find a lot of humor in the way that we today have lost um, so much transcendental knowledge. It's just gone out the window, you know, because, because we've adopted uh, Looney Tunes ideas about ourselves, about the world, and uh, anyway, but... Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of this. so here's again I'm gonna use the guitar string analogy see the uh, note that you hear when you pluck that string when you hear it is that where the guitar is no okay the, the guitar or the guitar string is not where the sound is heard it could be situated elsewhere. Okay, it, it, it need not necessarily be here per se. Okay, this is uh, one of the biggest um, spiritual lessons you can learn. Your um, life essence your spirit, if you want to call it that, okay? I don't like using that term so much because uh, it's been misused so often. It's been very seriously misused. 
by people who don't know what the hell they're talking about. Okay? Uh, but the that life essence, the essence, the spirit that allows you to be doesn't need to go anywhere to, to uh, express itself in this reality, okay? It doesn't need to come into this reality. Do you follow what I'm saying? I hope I'm not confusing you too much. It doesn't need to come and go anywhere. Okay? By virtue of what it is, it simply is able to express itself through this vessel. You, that's all you are, this, this, this body here, okay? I don't mean that's all you are in the total, in, in the total sense, in, 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 in its totality. But I'm saying that uh, who you are physically, which is basically, as I said, just the elements put together, constructed um, as a result of um, chemical and biological processes, which are also a part of um, the ultimate... Uh, uh, ultimate spiritual uh, truth, if you want to call it that. Okay, uh, the, the life forces, the energies manifest here. Okay, but they do not. Um, how, can, how can I say this more clearly? I'm trying to think. Let's put it this way. So the spirit need not necessarily be occupying this space and time in order to express itself through the vessel which is you. Okay? This is the thing. So, people often ask, you know, and, and I find it funny because of the reasons I said, is, is, you know, people often ask, what happens when you die? <laughs> right? Where does your spirit go when you die? And, and I laugh because it, it doesn't go anywhere, just like it didn't have to go anywhere to be here. How did you, how did, how did you come into being? How did your, uh, you know, and, and then there's different answers people will give to that question, of course, uh, because if they're materialists, they will say, well, you know, you come into being through conception and so on and so forth. And yes, yes, we understand all of that, but it's not the be all and end all. There's a reason why some people are still born. Okay, that, that is to say the life force, the life energy, the essence comes into being and then refuses to be. And it's heartbreaking for, you know, um, mothers in that type of situation. But there are reasons why those kind of things, unfortunately, uh, you know, that are beyond the material understanding. That's why when people experience these things, okay, that are actually, see, these are truly mystical experiences that people have in life, okay? I don't know if I should be explaining so much to you really, but uh, there are experiences people have which are very deeply mystical in nature, but you wouldn't know it because they have been um, relegated to the position of just being everyday occurrences. Okay? A great example is the basic process of breathing. If I told you breathing is a spiritual process, some of you would be shocked by this. You would say it's the most mundane thing you can do. If I told you that seeing something with your eyes you don't actually see with your eyes, by the way. Your brain interprets it and then transmits that to your mind. But the point is, if you see something, okay, you don't automatically think, oh, I'm having a mystical experience. But that's a mystical experience. It is. Okay, because there's no reason. There's Today even, Actually, let me make this point. Even today, scientists of all calibers in, in various fields still don't understand how we see. 
not in its fullness. Yes, they know the brain does this thing and then, but how do you actually see something? How do you discern in terms of what you're seeing? Where is the uh, component part? Okay, going by the materialist view, you, you should ask this. Where is the component part that makes you see? Who is doing the seeing? Show me the thing that is doing the seeing. And they can't. And they never will be able to. Do you understand? This is how deep these things are. They've been kept for, from people for a very, very long time, hundreds of years. These basic mystical truths about life and death. Now, you know, this is just a, a brief kind of, this video is really just a brief um, introduction to some things. But in real terms, spiritual truths go even deeper than all of this. If I've already, some of you might be saying, you know, because you're new to the channel or, or what have you, and yes, I speak about a myriad of many things, but, you know, many people might say, well, you know, um, this is mind-blowing. This is What I've told you in the last, um, um, let me check the counter, it's 46 minutes or so. What I've told you in 46 minutes is nothing. Okay, in true terms, it's absolutely a drop in the ocean. But, again, it'll go over the heads of a lot of people. You know, it, it, it'll take time for real understanding, deep understanding, to manifest itself again in this world of ours. It'll take time for people to come to terms with their own mortality. And why should you fear your mortality? This is the other thing. Why should you fear it? All these examples of extreme um, cowardice, when great evils and injustices happen to any one human being or many human beings, okay, people get afraid and, and they cower in the corner and they, you know all this business because they're afraid of these existential threats to their being, physically. But if I tell you, look, there's nothing to be afraid of in dying, okay, there's nothing about your own mortality that should frighten you. Okay, there are parts of, of, of the dying process I'll say this in, as, as, a, as a close off here, really. There are parts of the process of dying, in the process of dying, that you need to make peace with. One example is that you will not be able to hear anything anymore. Okay, I want you to think deeply about all this stuff, by the way, after you watch this. Okay, go away and think about it somewhere in a quiet corner. There will be a point in time when you can't hear anymore, when you don't see anymore, when you can't smell anymore, when you can't touch anything anymore. And I want you to meditate on those facts very deeply. I myself actually spent two years doing exactly that. Which is when people ask, how can you speak up on this or speak out about that and not be afraid? This is the reason. Because I am totally completely um, adjusted to the fact that I will die. I'm hoping it won't be immediate, and I hope it's not immediate for you either, right? But the point is that one day this will happen. I know this, and I know that the, the, the processes which will happen. There are certain spiritual texts, Vedic texts, uh, and shamanic texts, which go through the process of um, which explain the process of death as well. Because it's, it's either known knowledge that's garnered uh, from deep introspection, or they, these people also have observed people who are in the process of dying. 
Okay, and near-death experiences and all kinds of very interesting things come into it as well. But the point being, understanding a thing makes you not afraid of it. Similarly, I'm not afraid of other types of existential um, situations that I might find myself in. Say, you know, I'm like for example, I'm not afraid of being poor because I have been poor. Okay, I've been in a position where, um, and I don't share this very often, but I, you know, I'm just in. I guess I'm I'm in that uh, frame of mind, so I will. I'm in a sharing mood. Okay, uh, but there was a time in my life where um, I I did not eat for days and days and days. Okay, uh, and I I didn't um, think, oh my God, you know I'm gonna die. That never happened. There was a time in my life. There there have been all kinds of things that have happened to me, for example, and I've never felt that sort of thing after coming to these realizations that I did, okay, or, or studying these deep spiritual paths. I, I never felt um, out of control or in some way as if um, I had to be in control. I never felt that about any of these things. It was just a case of I was in flux all the time, and so things were changing. And I knew that these, these things were temporary, and that they would pass, and new things would happen. Other things, many things, and they have. So this is the key point, okay? You have to obliterate this uh, fear. That doesn't mean you can't have a healthy sense of, uh, what would we call it, um, concern. Okay, like if there is a genuine existential threat to you, yes, you should be concerned. Of course, again, depending on how deep in meditation one becomes, there will be a point where you're also not concerned as well. Right, and that isn't necessarily a bad thing if you know what you're doing. Um, but let's just say, for the sake of argument, for the time being, you can be concerned about uh, whatever might happen in any given situation. That's okay. But as long as you never let that fear dominate you, okay, control your actions. That that is, you know, you you can't let it control your actions. Fear of mortality must never control your actions. Otherwise, you will spiral into being a horrendous human being. That is what I've found anyway, amongst most of the people that I've looked at, whether through history, whether contemporary folks, you find that the people uh, who, who do the worst things, who commit the worst atrocities, oftentimes um, were, were people who were absolutely petrified of dying. And by the way, the fact that some of them commit suicide doesn't uh, preclude the fact that they were um, afraid of dying. And like I explained, many people who are suicidal, oftentimes, they are afraid of uh, existential threats and of, um, weirdly enough, dying. They're just too... Uh, they're, in, they're, in, they're in too much of a state of inner turmoil and suffering to care about the deeper ramifications of suicide. That's all that really happens. Okay, there, there's such a deep internal crisis in such people that they, they, they just, uh, they, they literally can't go on. That's what's happening. They can't go on expressing themselves here in this physical reality because they, they have, um, they have caused themselves so much pain and suffering and others so much pain and suffering and they know that at some level and, you know, this kind of thing. And it need not be also a representation of reality in their minds. Okay? Yes, in, in terms of tyrants and such, this happens. But one, one thing I'll say as well, just, just to not correct, but just 
modify slightly in terms of people who do become suicidal. It need not be a true um, objective state of suffering. If they feel a state of suffering, okay, if they have the sensation of suffering in their own mind, that can be enough. If they feel that they have caused some harm or injury or they could to someone else uh, or, or that they've hurt somebody in some absolutely unimaginable way when in fact maybe they didn't, some of them do, but the point is all these things can weigh on a person and uh, you then engage in that uh, self-annihilation, the self-annihilatory act of taking your own life. And you should never do that. Because what you'll find um, if you do that is that you will put yourself you will put your essence, your spirit, into a constant state of karmic turmoil, okay? Um, but I won't say too much about that because, it will, see, if I start going into very deep spiritual concepts, what will happen is people will, will freak out because they won't know what to do with that. You know, the mass of audience, maybe a lot of people do want to know, but I, I want to make it bite-sized with this stuff. Anyway, um, as I say, you have to come to terms with um, your own impermanence, the fact that you will die. Hopefully it won't be immediate, uh, nor should it be in the near term either. I wish you a very long and happy life, uh, full of contentment, uh, full of prosperity, um, and many other joys which are there in life. Uh, but for those uh, to happen, you first have to eradicate these subconscious uh, fears, these uh, these these uh, barriers in the mind, which prevent you from living your life to the absolute fullest, from taking joy in every moment. Anyway, there's many more things I could say, but uh, I will leave it there. I think we're coming up to almost an hour or so. I'll leave it there for this video. But I want to thank you very much for watching. I am interested to hear what all your thoughts are as well. And um, it would be good to, uh, to see if uh, other people have other insights in terms of what motivates people towards doing, uh, you know, or committing uh, atrocities or, or, or putting, you know, humanity through states of suffering. Do you think there's more to it than the fear of mortality? I'm very interested in finding that out. If there's stuff that I've missed out, if you think that maybe that's not all it is that's motivating people, uh, feel free to tell me. But I think the, the actual root of evil, a lot of it, if not all of it, uh, does come from this, this misunderstanding of reality, this misunderstanding of uh, our existence. Anyway, as I say, thanks very much for watching. Take good care of yourselves and God bless every one of you.